something. All right, let's open our Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15. If you're new with us and you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one of those Burgundy Bibles in the pew in front of you, or as I read the text, it'll come up on the screen here in a few moments. Um, if you're new to the Bible, you don't know much about the Bible, uh, it's okay. Uh, open up that Burgundy Bible. We're going to be on page number 832. Um, in that Bible, you're going to notice really big numbers. Those big numbers are chapters, uh, and then those little tiny numbers are verses. And we're just going to talk from Mark chapter 15, verse 33, down to Mark chapter 16, verse 8. A couple books that would be of encouragement for you today. Um, if you don't know much about the gospel and you want to know more about the gospel, this little book called What is the Gospel is one of the best clear presentations about the gospel that I can give you. And we'll have those available for you to go to the bookstore, take a look at them. Also, R.C. Sproul wrote a book here a few years ago that he called his most important book he's ever written, which seems like a lot because he's written a lot of books. And it's just this simple book, The Truth of the Cross. So if you want to know what is the truth of the cross of Jesus coming, this little book will help you. Those two books will be at the bookstore in our library over here to my left, and you can check those out if you'd like. Uh, this last Friday, Luis, on our Good Friday service, did a masterful job of preaching to us the reality and the reasons of Jesus' crucifixion. And he talked about how Jesus died and why Jesus died and what Jesus' death accomplished for us. And to summarize his sermon, here's what he basically said. Jesus Christ willingly gave himself to die by crucifixion so that the wrath of God would be satisfied for sinners like you and I. And by Jesus' willing death, anyone who puts their trust in Jesus is made right with God and God remembers their sin no more. Now on purpose, we left Good Friday at the crucifixion scene. We left Good Friday with the sense that Jesus has died at the cross. And we left Jesus there at the cross because that's Good Friday. It's really to celebrate and to remember the crucifixion of Jesus. But that brings us to today. Today is what we call Easter Sunday, or we'd call it Resurrection Sunday. And to set the stage for our text in Mark this morning, here's where we're at so you can kind of visualize this in your mind. We are at the place where Jesus Christ died. It's a small hill just outside of Jerusalem. It's a place called Golgotha, the place of a skull. It's a, the day is as dark as night. The crowd is standing in stunned silence about what has taken place. As we read earlier, there was an earthquake that took place. The veil of the temple, which is the Jews' most holy place, has been ripped from top to bottom by the hand of God, indicating that the way to God has been opened because Jesus Christ was crucified. That's where we are as we start our text this morning. So stand with me, and we're going to read Mark chapter 15, verse 33, through Mark chapter 16, verse 8. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and Joseph and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a, a respected member of the council, who also himself looking, was looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought 
a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of a rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices and they, they might, that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were, they, and they were, they were there saying to one another, who will roll the stone away from, for us from the, for the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had already been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment, it seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word and we open it, we believe it is inspired and God-breathed and true. And when we come to these moments to hear the word of God preached to us, it is no less a worship moment than the moments we were singing your songs and declaring your praise. So this morning, Father, as the Word of God is preached, as the Word of God is opened, may our hearts rise to worship and rise to praise the One who has lived and died and been raised from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God and is our King and our Lord and our Master. And may we today, Your people, be affected once again by the resurrection of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' precious, power, powerful, and preeminent name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest Gospel of all the Gospels. But one of the intriguing parts of the Gospel of Mark is that Mark is banging one note over and over again through his short Gospel. And it's this note. Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. Mark is like a mosaic. You know what a mosaic is where they take certain parts or tiles and they piece them together to make, to make one big picture. And Mark is like a mosaic where the writer is taking many different stories about Jesus to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is authentically the Son of God. And one of the centerpieces is found in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, when the centurion who is the eyewitness to this scene of the crucifixion, declares these words. After Jesus died, truly, this was the Son of God. So the crucifixion, and as we'll see the resurrection, are indicators that with what, that what the centurion said is exactly true. Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. Now we read about Jesus' death in, in Mark's normal brevity in chapter 15, verse 37. Notice how Mark talks about the death of Jesus. And I find this remarkable when he says this, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And that's it. There's no fanfare. There's no dynamic conclusion. There's no you know curtains calling shut. There's no applause. It's just simple death. Much like we would experience if we were in a hospital room and one of our loved ones breathed their last and they died. Just he breathes his last and then he dies. But what I want you to do for a moment is just put yourself at this scene for a moment. Imagine the difficulty of what these women are experiencing. Imagine just for a moment that you, moms, are Mary, the mother of Jesus, and you're watching your son breathe his last. Imagine that you're those women who have been ministering to him and knowing him very closely, and you're watching someone that you dearly love breathe their last and die. The emotion of this moment, the sorrow, the pain, are words that we really cannot describe or understand. Imagine for a moment that you're one of the disciples. You're one of those 12 men that were some of the closest associates of Jesus on the face of the earth. Imagine that you're Peter, James, or John, one of the three who have followed Jesus virtually everywhere. And imagine the horrific 
fear that you're going through in this moment. From all indication of the gospel writers, there's only one that was at that scene of crucifixion, and it was John. Every other one potentially was running through Jerusalem in a panic, not knowing what to do. Because can you imagine their fears? Was Jesus Christ not the promised king they had waited on to restore all of Israel? He can't die. He cannot die. The promised Messiah is not supposed to die. From Peter's sorrow for denying Jesus to the other's disillusionment, this scene must have been absolutely horrific for those who were standing by and watching what took place. And yet, verse 37 drives home this death nail, and he breathed his last, and he died. And the mosaic of Mark As Mark is declaring over and over again, Jesus is the Son of God, this death scene, this verse 37 does not make sense. It doesn't fit that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, dies. It doesn't fit that the King of the universe, the one who was there at the the moment when God created all things, should breathe His last. And that is exactly what Mark tells us, that He breathed, his last, and he died. It's, it's Mark saying to us, I want you to see the finality and the reality of the death of Jesus. Mark wants us to see that Jesus Christ died a real death. And you'll notice, that's why he defines all the things about his burial. Verse 46 tells us that he was buried in a real tomb. Now what's intriguing about this is the Romans did not have burial plans for criminals. What the Romans liked to do was leave the bodies up on the cross until they decayed and let the wild animals rip them down from the cross. They didn't have these type of plans. So that's why Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. For the Romans to do what they liked to do, leaving the bodies on the cross, violated the Jewish laws because the Jews believe that even the most vile criminals deserve not to hang on a tree, but yet to have a proper and appropriate burial before sunset. So Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the ruling council of Israel, a man who's looking for the kingdom of God, a secret follower of Jesus, goes to ask for this body so he can prepare it for burial in the Jewish custom. He goes on the day of preparation, which we're told is the day prior to the Sabbath, which gives us, it gives us the exact day of Jesus' death on the cross, because if the Jewish Sabbath was Saturday, the day before would be Friday, and that tells us that Good Friday is indeed the Friday that we celebrate the death of Christ. So Mark goes into the description of Jesus' burial, to help us ensure and understand that Jesus died a real death, was buried in a real tomb. That's why he emphasizes the burial shroud, laying him in a tomb cut out of rock and placing a large stone against the entrance of the tomb, helping us see Jesus died a real death. That's why in verses 44 and 45, Pilate is shocked that Jesus died so quickly. What you might not know about a crucifixion is it normally took a person of a crucifixion who is a victim of crucifixion a long, horribly long death. might take them as long as a week to die. In the history of crucifixion, they did not let them live on the crucifixion cross. They left them there until they died. Of all the thousands crucified, there's always been... Every person on a cross has died of that particular death. This is why Pilate was shocked. This is why Pilate called for the centurion. The same man in verse 39 that we read about, declaring this was the Son of God, called this eyewitness to come in and say, is he indeed really dead? Did he die this quickly? Really died. Now as the Bible tells us, Jesus is... Real death was a willing sacrifice for our sins. His death is what we call a substitutionary death. It's where Jesus took our place to demonstrate 
God's love for us. Jesus came to willingly die for us that we might be made right with God and be set free from the power and the penalty of our sin. But at this point, with Jesus dead, we have a very big implied problem. Here's the problem. Since Jesus' death was real, are we really completely made right with God and eternally forgiven of our sins if He's dead? So if He's dead, can Jesus really free us from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death, if He Himself has been conquered by that same death? How could Jesus free us from the power of sin if Jesus Himself was overcome by such power. That's why Resurrection Sunday is absolutely necessary to the Christian faith. You've heard me say as a church before that there are open-handed issues that we discuss and we debate and dialogue about and we won't divide over. There are closed-handed issues that we will divide over and say, nope, sorry, this is what a true believer believes The resurrection is a closed-handed issue. It is an issue to us as Christians that is a non-negotiable because it is absolutely necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead in order for His death to become effective and powerful for us as Christian people. That's why Mark in chapter 16 then makes a very quick transition to the resurrection scene. As we leave the burial scene, we're told at the end of chapter 15 that the same two Marys who were at the crucifixion saw where he was laid. Then beginning chapter 16, he mentions these same faithful women, once again, who came to the tomb to finish what could not be done on the day of preparation. And as they come to the tomb, they saw the large stone rolled away, Jesus gone, and an angel tells them that he has been raised from the dead. Now by using these references throughout Mark chapter 16, Mark is showing to us that Jesus not only died a real death, but Jesus' resurrection was real as well. Notice that Mark mentions these two women, and potentially one other one, over and over again, from crucifixion to burial to resurrection. In this narrative, you'll notice that he does this from verse 40 to 47 to chapter 16, verse 1. Since Mark is putting, Mark is trying to put finishing touches on this mosaic. It's like Mark is in a courtroom and Mark is saying, let me show you clearly why Jesus Christ is the Son of God, why He's authentically the Son of God, and just to close it off, let me show you that there were eyewitnesses to every event that took place that might be doubted. So he uses these two and potentially three women to declare to us that there were eyewitnesses who saw the facts of his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. So Mark makes sure that these, these, that he lists these two women over and over again for the entire scene to just give us the litmus test that eyewitnesses prove this account. Another part of the evidence that you're going to notice about the reality of the resurrection is the fact that Mark places each of these women at certain points that might be doubted along the way. He puts the women at at the crucifixion scene. He puts the women at the burial site. And he puts the women at the resurrection. Every one of those are important moments in this entire dialogue about Jesus Christ being truly the Son of God. Their presence at each location in this journey reveals there is no mistake in these events. These events really took place. It has been evidenced by two, potentially three or more witnesses, which to the Jews would make every fact be true. Every crucial point along the journey, you notice eyewitness accounts. And another piece of evidence that Mark kind of slides in is this little issue of the stone being rolled away. You notice something funny. I'm I'm a big proponent when you're studying your Bibles. Notice words being used over and over again. Notice how often the stone is referenced in this dialogue. 
at the end of verse chapter 15, verse 46, to make sure we understand that Joseph rolled the stone against the tomb. In chapter 16, verse 3, when the women were concerned, how are we going to roll this stone away? It's too big. To chapter 16, verse 4, as the stone is rolled away, and then it was very large. Mark is using these references, the women and the stone, to show us that there's some earthly evidence that the resurrection really happened. But then there's not just earthly evidence, there's heavenly and divine evidence. You'll notice that, that not only do we see heavenly, earthly things being talked about, we see some heavenly things mentioned that Jesus Christ is really raised from the dead. Verse 5 of chapter 16 tells us what? There is an angel in the tomb. Mark, in, a, in an almost nonchalant way, talks about this angel. He mentions him as a, as a young man. Almost like something you'd see every day of your life. But do you notice the reaction of the women? This will tell you it's not something you'd have every day of your life. The angel actually says to them, do not be alarmed. You know what the word alarm means? It means this, do not be scared to the point of distress. It means this, stop freaking out. Stop losing your mind. Settle down. If this is just a young man, these women are not reacting that way. These women are shaking in their sandals at what they saw. This was not a hallucination. They were clear-headed, yet they were scared to death. The angel's presence is divine evidence that God has done something miraculous and important. See, all throughout the Bible, when God was going to do something miraculous or heavenly, or God is, has done something miraculous or heavenly, He would send an angel to meet with people. He did this with Abram. He did this with Daniel. He did it with Zechariah to tell them something divine was about to take place. The divine messenger that we see in Mark chapter 16 is right in line with God's way of declaring to His people something miraculous has indeed taken place. This angel is divine evidence. But there's another aspect of divine evidence that we can't miss. It's in the fact that there's no Savior in the tomb. That's quite a big deal. When the women entered the tomb, the angel told them that Jesus was no longer there because He had been risen from the dead. And He even invites them to take a look at the location so they can determine for themselves another moment of eyewitness account. And notice what the angel says to them. Don't, don't miss this at all. The one who was crucified, He is risen. Meaning again, connecting the entire scene from crucifixion to burial to resurrection. Meaning these ladies who were standing at the crucifixion saw where Jesus had been buried and now are evidencing the fact that this Savior has been raised from the dead. They are standing in the very tomb where they laid the crucified Savior and He is not there. It is divine evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, now, words really don't describe this moment. I mean, going from that Friday afternoon and all the sorrow and all the, the anxiety and all the fear to this moment. Now, what you might find in this text is isn't funny, it's, it's like intriguing, is they are fearful yet joyful. Have you ever been so happy that you're afraid? I haven't. I've never had that moment. I've never been in a moment where somebody's been, you know, sat up in their coffin, right? I had a pastor tell me years ago, he was doing a funeral in the days when they didn't tie bodies down and they weren't embalmed. And as the guy was up preaching, the body sat up in the coffin and everybody ran out the door, right? Yeah, that's the only thing I can figure what this might have been like, right? None of us can understand how they had this paradox of crazy emotion. Exceedingly afraid, yet exceedingly joyful. And yet the angel tells him to go tell the disciples, and especially Peter, and every indication is they went in haste to go do that very thing. And Mark, 
in typical Mark fashion, ends the scene very abruptly. It's over. Scene is over. And yet, just because the ending is abrupt, does not stop the facts. The facts are this. Jesus Christ died a real death of crucifixion on Friday, was buried in a real tomb on Friday night, and on Saturday morning was raised in a very real resurrection from the dead. Now the question that we have to ask on Easter Sunday, we have to do it every Easter Sunday, is this question, what do we do with this real death and this real resurrection of Jesus? And the first thing that we should do is recognize that the resurrection declares Jesus to be the Son of God. So what it does, it declares Him to be the Son of God. Romans 1 makes this amazing declaration when speaking about Jesus. It says this, And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, again, this is exactly what the Gospel writer Mark has been trying to do, has it not? To prove that Jesus is authentically the Son of God. It's the last point or last piece of Mark's mosaic to describe perfectly Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. The one who stopped the storms. The one who fed the needy. The one who healed the sick is authentically the Son of God because He's been raised from the dead by the power of God. There is no other display, no other point in the life of Jesus that declares Him to be the Son of God as the resurrection does. Without the resurrection, Jesus is still in a tomb and He is not approved of by God to be the Son of God. He must rise again from the dead. Jesus Christ is God's Son and the resurrection, friends, is living proof that this is true. And that means we, we've, we've got to do some work with that. So listen, do, do you believe that Jesus is authentically the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ came, lived life perfectly because you can't, you don't, and you won't? And He died in your place to satisfy the wrath of God in your place. And He rose again from the dead three days later and is now seated at the right hand of God to secure your eternal redemption. Do you, do you believe that? See, if you're here and you don't believe that, it's a great day to believe that. It's a great day to put your trust and your confidence in the risen Savior. And if you're here and that's where you are, probably chances are somebody who's a friend brought you to church today. We're so glad you're here. Glad you're with them. Maybe today at lunch, just say to them, hey, can we talk about what that preacher said? I want to understand this issue of Jesus really being my Savior. Can you show me Jesus? Can you point me to Christ? Maybe maybe you came in on your own today and you're just like, I need to go to church on a Sunday and I'm glad you're here. Just grab somebody before you leave and say, hey, can we talk about what that guy said about Jesus being the Son of God? I need to deal with that before the Lord. Don't, don't leave today without doing some work in your heart about that. But if you're a Christian today, listen, th this is the reason... That we worship Jesus. <laughs> this is the reason we submit our lives to Him. He is to be revered, honored, and worshipped, and loved because of what the resurrection says about Him. It says that He is the Son of God, and He is declared to be the Son of God by God. The highest authority in all the universe has said, this one and this one alone is the Son of God. He is the King of our lives and the ones that we and the one that we submit ourselves to. But the resurrection isn't just something that we declare; it is also something that does something for us. It does something for us. See, it's a, it's a beacon of hope for everyone who believes in Jesus that we have been set free from the power 
and the penalty of our sin. Jesus' perfect life and death as a man, as our substitute, as our representative before God, breaks the neck of sin's power over us. But His resurrection makes that work effective and powerful. See, here's where this dilemma of Jesus being dead leads us to the necessity of the resurrection. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we who trust in His substitutionary life and death are no longer under the power of sin. We're raised to walk in a brand new way. We're no longer under sin's power and dominion because of this reason. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Sin has no power over Jesus, and therefore sin has no power over us. And if He stayed dead, sin's penalty, which is eternal death, would be effective and powerful toward us because it had been effective and powerful toward our Savior. But friends, what have we read about in the book of Mark? What have we just studied just briefly this morning? Jesus didn't stay dead. See, He he not only broke the back of sin through His crucifixion, He satisfied God's demand for death. And because He's been raised... We are no longer under sin's penalty because God's wrath has been satisfied and defeated by Jesus Christ dying and being raised again. Jesus, as our forerunner, is the victorious conqueror over the grave. And because He was raised from the dead to eternal life, we who believe in Him will be raised to eternal life as well. That means, listen, if you trust in Jesus, there is no eternal left, no eternal death, and no wrath of God aimed at you ever again. That has been satisfied by God. Our Savior is alive. And because He is alive, we will live eternally with Him. And the truth of this literally transforms the way that we live. It transforms everything that we do. An example of this is found at the end of Mark, the very book that we've just studied. It's in the life of this man named Joseph of Arimathea. This man was conflicted. He had one foot in the Sanhedrin council, who was the ruling council of of Israel that declared that Jesus should be crucified. But yet, he's a secret follower of Christ. He's not, he's not really different than many of us. One foot in the world, wanting to please the people of the world and the things of the world. One foot in following Jesus as people trying to do it right in this world. But look at what happens to this man when Jesus dies and the effect it has upon his soul. Verse 43 of chapter 15 says it this way, Joseph took courage and went to Pilate. Now you might ask, why did he need to take courage? Because Joseph knew the moment that he went to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body, he would be aligning himself with Jesus. And by aligning himself with Jesus... All of his influence, all of his friendships, all of his business associations, his entire reputation would be at best challenged and at worst be lost. Yet because Jesus died, Joseph goes from being conflicted about where he stands and who he is to taking courage to go to Pilate and risking all that he has because he knows this man, this truly is the Son of God. And historical traditions tell us that Joseph of Arimathea was very possibly imprisoned and later in his life became one of the greatest influences on the gospel going to Britain. All 
because he was transformed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Sin had no more power over him anymore. Joseph goes from being a secret saint to a courageous disciple and missionary. That's quite a transformation. It's quite a guy that realizes, I'm tired of being conflicted in this world. And this provides incredible hope for us. Listen, because Jesus has been raised from the dead, friends, those of us who believe in this, God transforms us by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive and at work in us, transforming us from being conflicted to having courage. God transforms us by the power of Christ at work in us. The resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and proves that Jesus' life and death satisfied God's demands on us. So listen, we can stop living in fear of wrath and eternal torment. We can stop living conflicted in this world and begin to live courageously in Christ. We can go from being secret saints, kind of hiding in our room at night, praying to God, to actually declaring His name before all of our friends around us. Because why? We have this hope that Jesus Christ has died and was raised. We have hope in this life and in the life to come. We, we are raised to live in a brand new way because Jesus has come. Now listen, this weekend we have come face to face with the centerpiece of Jesus' life. Jesus Himself said, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. And Friday night, we looked at the fact that Jesus did that very thing. He came and gave His life for us. And then Sunday morning, we're confronted with the beauty and the wonder of His resurrection. We're confronted with the reality of these two events that Jesus Christ willingly gave up His life and He was placed in a real tomb and He really was raised from the dead. We're confronted with these facts. And so this morning, this weekend, as we're here together, we, we're confronted with this truth. Is this what you believe about Jesus? Is Jesus Christ indeed your Savior? Is He the one that you've trusted to die for your sin, be raised again from the dead, and the one now seated at the right hand of God. And if you're a child of God and you said, yes, I absolutely do claim that, then just, again, ask yourself, then are, 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 is my life lived in a way that reveals the transforming work of the power of Christ? Or am I still that conflicted Joseph of Arimathea? A secret disciple. And maybe this morning as we close our time today, it's just, it's just time to repent. It's time for you who don't know Jesus to put your trust in Christ. It's time for you who do know Jesus to just take a moment, thank God for the wonder of the resurrection, look to Christ again for the work of transformation and ask Him to transform you by His great power so that you can boldly proclaim His name in this world. Wherever it is, I trust God will go to work and do His work in you. So let's pray. Father, we are freshly aware this morning that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. We are freshly aware this morning that if the wages of sin is death, Jesus died in our place for our death. But the wages of a perfect life is life, 
And that's why you raised him from the dead, because he was perfect. He could not stay dead. Because he is the Savior, the perfect Savior, the perfect substitute, the perfect representative before you for us. And so, Father, this morning we, we place our confidence and our hope in Jesus. And Lord, I pray this morning for those that are here that don't know Jesus. First, Lord, I thank you for them being here. We're grateful they've come and enjoyed worshiping Jesus today with us. And I just pray that you would convict their hearts of sin. Reveal the reality of your love displayed in Christ. And cause them to repent of their sin and trust Jesus. I pray for those of us that are believers this morning that the resurrection would be an everyday experience for us. That we would not only be mindful, that we would be grateful. That we would not only be people that want to live for you in this world, but we would trust you to transform us to live courageously in this world for the glory of Christ. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us today. Do your work among us and thank you that you will. In Jesus' name we pray.